far away as possible. As he ran out, he ran into 18-year-old Charles Diles, who was in his truck. With the gun he had, he threatened Charles, got into the passenger side, and instructed him to drive. At gunpoint, Charles Diles drove for three hours. After this, Alva then instructed Charles to get out of the driver's seat and lie down on the floor of the truck. When Charles refused, Alva shot him twice. He then abandoned the truck and fled on foot. He was caught later. J reaction music. Today, what happened to convincers who survived extinction on death row? What really happened? Like, if they to survive, right? What y'all supposed to do next? Like, let me be a, a free citizen, or just let me walk out at at and like nothing happened. Like, subscribe and hit that post notification bell. Death row is final. The capital punishment reserved for the worst of crimes nearly always ends in the death of the convict, either through lethal injection, hanging, or other forms of execution. However, there have been instances where people have seemingly cheated death and somehow survived execution. So what happens in a situation like this? In this video, we'll be taking you through the incredible stories of people who survived death row and just what happened after. John Babacombe Lee first. Let's talk about perhaps the most well-known survivor of an execution attempt, Englishman John Babacombe Lee. John Lee was born in Abbotsker's Well, Devon in 1864. He was alleged to have murdered his own employer, Emma Keyes, at her home with a knife on the 15th of November. What, what the reason you had murdered her? Like, why would you murder your own employee for? Like, there, there's so much reason to this, but you have your reason. Good, good. Uh, Girl like this? Why would you murder someone like, like that? Like I want to hear it. I want to hear it. 1884. There wasn't much to prove his involvement in the death of Emma, apart from the fact that he had a suspicious cut on his arm, and he had had a pretty extensive rap sheet as a thief. None of this was particularly substantial to the case. But then again, this was the late 19th century, a time when many of the legal principles that we use today were a little less defined. The case against him seemed satisfactory to the court, and even though he pleaded his innocence and the case was mostly circumstantial, John Lee was convicted for Emma Keyes' murder and was sentenced to death. He was set to to be executed by hanging on the 23rd of February, 1885. Pending that time, he was to be detained at the infamous Exeter prison. When the time came for him to be executed, though, things took a weird turn. The trapdoor of the scaffold on which John Lee stood failed to open. This was a little odd, as the trapdoor had been previously tested and was fully functional before. After an are y'all sure the trapdoor was testing? Y'all, are y'all sure? So we go back, right? And we go back a couple minutes before. I look. I you sure right here? You sure that trapdoor was testing? Can can is that trapdoor was testing? Ain't no way that trapdoor got stuck like that. Got stuck, probably tested and was fully functional before. After another set of testing, John was placed on the platform again, and again the trapdoor refused to open. A third time they tried to execute him, and they failed. By this time, the medical officer at the execution refused to continue with the proceedings, and the execution attempt ended. The very weird circumstances of John Lee's failed execution attempt raised quite the stir both publicly and at the Home Office. The Home Secretary at the time, Sir William Harcourt, was interested in knowing just what had gone wrong, and so he ordered an immediate investigation into the matter. He then lessened the sentence on John Lee from the death sentence to a life sentence. When the results of the investigation were released, it was discovered that the drawbar on the gallows had been affected when it was moved from the old infirmary into the coach house. This had resulted in the hinges of the trapdoor being bound and unable to drop. It turned out that Lee had escaped death due to a minor alignment issue. However, not even a reduced sentence was enough for John Lee, who continued to petition the Home Office until he was finally released in 1907, after 22 years in prison. He not only didn't fully serve his first sentence of the death penalty, he managed to avoid even his commuted sentence. He became a national sensation, earning the nickname, The Man They Couldn't Hang. He even got to exploit the fame he got from the incident after his release. He wrote a book and even had a silent movie made about him. He eventually relocated to the USA, where he adopted the name James Lee and lived till 1945.
and Greenway. Before the events of the failed execution of John Lee over two whole centuries before, there was another English person who had survived getting executed. Her name was Anne Green. Anne worked as a scullery maid in the house of Sir Thomas Reed, a justice who lived in Dunstan, Oxfordshire. She lived the regular life of a 17th century maid until she was approached and seduced by Sir Reed's grandson, Geoffrey Reed. Geoffrey was about 16 or 17 at the time, but that didn't deter him from successfully wooing the 22-year-old Anne. As a result of their activities, she became pregnant. Anne was apparently oblivious to her pregnancy and carried on normally. It wasn't until she miscarried that she realized that she had been pregnant. This was after... Oh, yeah. You should do... You should do him. Wait, wait, wait a minute. You should do a, a minor? And then you... Oh, you should die. I, I don't care. You should die. 17 weeks of pregnancy. Scared of what would happen to her if the entire affair came to light. She decided to hide every evidence of it. That didn't go very well for her, as she was soon discovered. So Reed prosecuted Anne for infanticide. He prosecuted in line with the Concealment of Birth of Bastards Act, which gave the presumption of murder on a woman who had concealed the death of her illegitimate child. She pleaded her innocence, but her testimony, along with the testimony of a midwife that the fetus was too young and underdeveloped to be legally considered a living child was simply not enough, and she was sentenced to death for the crime of infanticide. On the 14th of December, 1650, Anne Green was executed by hanging. In fact, even while she hung, a soldier hit her repeatedly with the butt of his musket. Believing that she was dead, she was eventually lowered, and her body was given to the University of Oxford in order to further research. It was when she was brought in by Oxford physicians William Petty and Thomas Willis that they realized that the supposed cadaver they had been given was still alive. She was extremely weak and her vitals were faint, but she was not dead yet. The doctors moved quickly, treating her with all sorts, determined to save her life. Their efforts yeah, seemed to pay off as Anne recovered and was soon back to relatively fuck? normal health. News of Anne Green's recovery spread relatively wow. fast, and soon she became the talk of the town. When the authorities heard of what had happened, she was pardoned, as they believed that she must have been innocent, and so God himself had saved her. Anne went on to live for another nine years before her death in 1659. You can't lie. You can't lie. I um, don't... Do you think it's survived by um several bullet in him? And I don't know it. I don't know what rapper died. Oh no, not died. Survived by getting, by knocking a stab. I know two more stabs survived by by something. It's like by knife or gun or by one of them that two more. Kenneth Eugene Smith. I, I we go from 17th the century Eugene England. Eugene Smith to 21 St. Century Alabama. Yeah. Kenneth Smith, a man who in 1988 had been like, responsible like for the murder he of a woman, like was arrested, really tried, died. and eventually sentenced to death. However, unlike the previously stated cases, Kenneth's execution would take time. Most state-sanctioned executions nowadays aren't carried out right away, and many death row inmates spend quite a bit of time before they are executed. As a matter of fact, according to research done by the Bureau of Justice Statistics, oh, as of 2019, was, death row inmates spend an average of 264 months or 20 22 years before they are executed, if they are executed at all. And so even though Kenneth Smith was on death row, he would spend the next 33 years of his life incarcerated at the Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore, South Alabama. Eventually, his death warrant was signed, and it was finally time for him to be executed through lethal injection. Throughout his time in prison, Kenneth had come to terms with his death. When he was told about his upcoming execution, he accepted it gracefully. On the 17th of November, 2022, the day of his execution, Kenneth went through all the required process processes, but when he was finally strapped to the chair was where it all went wrong. At first, at 8.02 p.m., while he was strapped to the gurney but the procedure was yet to start, the 11th Circuit Appeals Court ordered a stay of his execution. However, instead of adhering to it, the prison officials went on with the procedure. Kenneth was supposed to be executed with a combination of drugs, metazolum hydrochloride, rucuronium bromide, and potassium chloride. Normally, these drugs will be delivered through an intravenous injection. Once inside his body, they would shut it down quickly and relatively painlessly. In fact, this swift form of execution is exactly why lethal injection has become more popular across the U.S. as the preferred form of execution. In Kenneth's case, unfortunately, this attempt was anything but swift and painless. The team that was supposed to administer the drugs poked and prodded needles into him, trying to find a workable vein, but no matter how much they tried, they just couldn't. After multiple attempts that lasted four hours, one of which involved stabbing at his neck, the team finally determined that they could not successfully carry out the procedure, and it was canceled. So what happened to Kenneth afterward? He was hyperventilating, dizzy, and was so weak he could not walk unassisted. 
He was taken back to his cell, and it was up to the state to determine what to do with him. In a shocking twist, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey decided to temporarily suspend the death penalty in Alabama so as to enable the state to investigate a series of lethal injections. Kenneth was not the only one who had unsuccessfully gone through an attempted execution. He remains alive today, and it is unsure whether his execution will be reattempted or if his sentence will be commuted instead. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Can I get in the lot today? I like that crazy. Like y'all, y'all, y'all change the something that man survived thing. Now he alive today. A lot of these people should should be dead right now for what they did. Joseph Samuel the German. Joseph Samuel is another well-known person who successfully survived death row. Born in 1780, Joseph was a notorious robber who was apprehended and transported to the British penal settlement at Sydney Cove for incarceration. However, prison just wasn't enough to hold Joseph in, and he succeeded in escaping. After his escape, he joined a gang. One day, his gang, in the process of robbing a house, killed a policeman stationed there named Joseph Luker. Murder of a police officer has always been a serious crime anywhere, and the gang was very quickly hunted down and apprehended. And Joseph, who had been all, identified all by a drugs. witness, soon confessed to the robbery, but not the murder of Mr. Luker. The His argument was not sufficient like to the court, like and following the principle of Joseph vicarious liability, which Who's states crime? that a person is but liable for not only the original crime they set out to commit, but any other crime committed in the process, he was convicted and sentenced to death. Ironically, the other members of the gang were acquitted of the charges against them for lack of evidence. On the 26th of September, 1803, Joseph was taken to Parramatta to be publicly executed by hanging. He was to be hung by slow strangulation, which was a pop- Me explain this to y'all. Hanging and like, you know the old way people are going to kill other people by hanging? Literally, if you watch some of the movie, hanging is by choking through a throat and you gotta have all the strength and force to like force and the rope gotta be real concerned because if a rope not concerned, Someone can end up slipping out from the rope and they fall. Popular method of execution at the time. A rope made of five cords of hemp was tied into a noose at the oh. end, and that noose was strapped over the neck of Joseph Samuel. Normally, within a few minutes into the execution, convicts would be dead. However, when Joseph's execution commenced, the rope snapped and he fell on his knees. It seemed like the only serious injury he sustained was a sprained ankle from this. By this time, the executioner, along with the crowd witnessing the execution, were amazed at what they saw. There had been another convict who had been strangled along with Joseph. He was almost dead while Joseph remained alive. The executioner quickly attached another rope to the gallows, solidly secured the noose around Joseph's neck, and reattempted the execution. This time, the noose slipped off his neck completely. Frustrated but intent on completing the execution, the executioner again... How did he manage to do that? Slip off! Ain't no way the rope slip off! Like, we all doing? It got, it got to be some type of way, because there's no way the rope slip off! Like, Bro, y'all ain't doing this, y'all job right. Y'all, y'all need to get fired. And got another rope and fastened the noose around Joseph's neck. Again, the rope snapped. He dropped to the ground and stumbled over. By this time, the crowd was in an uproar, demanding that Joseph be released as fate clearly wanted him alive. They were so insistent that it soon became apparent that the execution could not go on, and a policeman ordered a temporary delay of the execution till the governor was summoned to determine what would happen to Joseph. When the governor get the gun. And in this in this uh, shoot him or or get a knife and just stab him. Just stab him a couple of times and boom or get the gun and shoot him somewhere where you know that will punch him and kill him with one bullet. Governor arrived, he ordered an inspection of the ropes to ensure that there was no foul play. The inspection showed that there truly was nothing fishy going on, and so he agreed with the crowd that God willed Joseph Samuel to remain alive, and so he commuted his sentence to life imprisonment. He eventually died in prison in April 1806. Ramel Broom if we're going to talk about a person on this list who certainly didn't get what he deserved, we'll be talking about Rommel Broom. Rommel was born in Muskegon, Michigan on the 4th of June, 1956, and from a very young age, he was drawn to crime. Even as a teenager, Rommel committed so many crimes that he had to be detained at the Ohio Youth Commission in order to be rehabilitated. All attempts to rehabilitate him failed, and no sooner was he free than he began a streak of crimes. Robbery and rape seemed to be his specialty, especially the rape of little girls. He was arrested, and he 
he pleaded guilty to multiple counts of rape and armed robbery. He was sentenced to 7 to 25 years in prison. On the 11th of May, 1984, after less than 10 years in prison, he was released on parole. That was a mistake. He would go on to add murder to the list of his crimes when on the 21st of September, 1984, he abducted, raped, and murdered 14-year-old Trina Middleton as she was walking home with two of her friends from a football game. Two and a half months later, on the 6th of December... This man... Oh, hold on. We got, we got, we got to go back to, back, 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 good. This is ridiculous. You tell me. I'm with two of her friends from a football game. Let's go, let's go back a little bit. Back a little bit. Steak. He would go on to add murder to the list of his crimes when on the 21st of September, 1984, he abducted. So, so you tell me. This man right here abducted, raped, and murdered this girl. For one. Why, why, why would you go and steal a kid, and then you go have with the kid, and then you go and want to go, why, like, it, you're saying once you got released, you went back to your old ways, right, I can see you um, going murder, I can see you going and steal and stuff, but go murder, nah, nah, that's a big deal. Murder worse than stealing, and you're going raped. Uh, now they they better definitely kill you. I don't I don't want to hear or oh, it is some type of way you survive not dying. Abducted, raped, and murdered 14-year-old Trina Middleton as she was walking home with two of her friends from a football game. Two and a half months later, on the 6th of December, 1984, Rommel Broom attempted to abduct an 11-year-old girl by the name of Melinda Grissom. Melinda's mother, desperate to save the life of her daughter, held onto the car as she screamed for help. This not only saved the life of her daughter, but it helped lead to the arrest of Broom as two men who observed the whole ordeal noted down the license plate of the vehicle. This helped the police track down and arrest Rommel Broom later that very day. He was charged with murder, rape, kidnapping, and attempted kidnapping. His offer for a plea deal was rejected and he was convicted on all charges and sentenced to death. On the 15th of September 2009, he was set to be executed. However, things didn't go to plan. The executioners repeatedly tried for over two hours to maintain an intravenous line through which they could inject the drugs that would end Rommel's life, but they just couldn't. Eventually, the execution had to be stayed. The incident became quite popular and Rommel Broom and his lawyers... So you Pouring um drug into the system that will go all through the system and uh, and slowly by slowly each day by slowly by slowly when time pass the drugs will uh, lead to the heart and all through his system to where it will really kill him and stop in the heart and and he died but if it don't reach to the heart and 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 then reach the whole body, then, then it don't work. Smart. Just tried to capitalize on this to have his sentence commuted. But in the end, the Ohio Supreme Court ruled that the state would go through with his execution. All this did was buy Rommel time. The new date for his execution was set for the 17th of June, 2020. However, this date was pushed back further to the 16th of March, 2022. Broom would not live long enough to be executed, though, as he died from suspected COVID-19 complications at Franklin Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, on the 28th of December, 2020. Yes, somehow he managed to avoid death row and managed managed to live till he was 64 years old. John Smith born in 1661. John Smith was a notorious London housebreaker. However, crime wasn't always John's deal. After working a few jobs as a young man, he enlisted for and joined the Royal Navy, and he served till he was discharged after the Battle of Vigo Bay in 1702. After this, he enlisted as a soldier. This was where he started his career as a housebreaker. John was good, but not good enough not to get caught. Eventually, fate caught up with him, and he was tried for his crimes. He was convicted and was sentenced to death. Nowadays, the punishment would be seen as far outweighing the crime, but at the time, the court saw it as fair enough. John was set to be executed by hanging. On the set date for his execution, the noose was tied around his neck and the slow strangling began. However, as time went on, it seemed pretty clear that while he was clearly in a lot of pain, he was nowhere close to death. It got to the point where people started to pull at his feet, hoping to put enough pressure on the noose to finally kill him so as not to extend the pain that he was in. This didn't work and the crowd soon resorted to pleading for him to be released after about 15 minutes into the hanging. As a result of the clamor, 
John was actually released and he was immediately taken to be treated. He made a full recovery. A few months later, he was free. After this, he began to be known as Half-Hanged Smith. If you think this is where John Smith's story ends, you'd be quite wrong. Smith went on to continue his life of housebreaking soon after, but he managed to avoid incarceration and execution multiple times. Once, he was arrested and tried at the Old Bailey. Due to some complications of his case, the jury left the verdict to be determined by 12 judges. They set him free. Again, he was arrested. But the day before the trial that would have almost certainly resulted in his execution commenced, the prosecutor died and he was once again set free. On the 17th of May, 1727, 66-year-old John was found stealing a padlock. When he was searched further, eight picklock keys were also found with him. The evidence gathered was enough to prove that he had intended to burgle the warehouse he had been found at and he was found guilty of theft. He was sentenced to transportation to Virginia. There's no record of what happened to him after he was transported to Virginia, but chances are that he probably lived there the rest of his life, hopefully not breaking into houses anymore. William Duell. William Duell was just... So you tell me the man is still alive? Y'all try all the death row camp to kill this man and this man survived in walking down, walking as a free man. Uh-uh. Just 17 years old when he was convicted and sentenced to death. He had been an accessory to the rape of a woman, Sarah Griffin, in London. On the 24th of November, 1740, he was hanged. He was left to hang for 20 whole minutes, along with four other people. By the time he was finally cut down, everyone believed that he was dead. There was simply no reason to believe otherwise. As was standard practice at the time, his body, along with the bodies of the rest of the people executed with him, was given to the anatomy theater at the Worshipful Company of Barbers and Surgeons. The aim of this was so the body bodies could be dissected and used for medical research and training. This was nothing ordinary. However, something out of the ordinary did happen before he could be dissected. As he was being prepped to be worked on, one of the servants noticed that William Duell was actually breathing. His breath was faint, but it was certainly obvious that he was still alive. As time went on, his breathing only got faster and faster. The procedure that they had planned could not proceed, and so they had to change their plans to save his life. He was treated and he started to recover quite quickly. He was even able to sit up up after just two hours when he could finally speak and was questioned it turns out that he had absolutely no recollection of his hanging this was attributed to him having a bad fever during his trial and execution the fever possibly caused him to be a little unwell mentally too the doctors theorized that this had been what had saved his life even though there was no solid evidence proving that now that he was alive and seemed to be recovering quite well the question rose of what to do with William the doctors had absolutely no idea what to do and so they reported to the authorities who then picked him and returned him him to prison pending a decision on what to do with him. It didn't take long at all for the public to find out what had happened with William Duell. When they did, it raised a ton of excitement. The government now had a choice, reattempt his execution, commute his sentence, or simply release him. It was very clear that reattempting his execution would have been very unpopular. It was simply easier for the government to choose one of the remaining options. Eventually, they decided that his sentence would be commuted to transportation to America. This was a win-win for everyone. William would not be killed, but he wouldn't have to be worried about by the state again. This came at a period of time when the British were trying to decongest London, as they claimed it was overpopulated. Sending him to America meant that there was one less person to bother about. After his transportation, William Duell lived a full life in Boston. He even got to live through the American Revolution. He reportedly died in 1805 at an advanced age. Alva Campbell, Alva Earl Campbell Jr., cannot be said to have had an easy life. As a child, he was raised in a very abusive home. His parents were negligent and they sexually abused his sisters. Eventually, Alva's father was incarcerated and he and his sisters had to be taken from the custody of his mother. Perhaps his rough upbringing was a factor, but Alva moved to a life of crime and he became an armed robber. During the course of a robbery in 1972, Alva murdered a man named William Dovolosky. He was arrested and faced multiple charges for armed robbery and murder. On the 2nd of April, 1997, Alva developed a plan to escape. He claimed to be paralyzed, and so he was wheeled into the courthouse on a wheelchair. Once he got in, he sprung to action, overpowering the deputy that had brought him in and stealing her gun. His plan was simple, find any means to escape and then run as far away as possible. As he ran out, he ran into 18-year-old Charles Diles, who was in his truck. With the gun he had, he threatened Charles, got into the passenger side, and instructed him to drive. At gunpoint, Charles Diles drove for three hours. After this, Alva then then instructed Charles to get out of the driver's seat and lie down on the floor of the truck. When Charles refused, Alva shot him twice. He then abandoned the truck and fled on foot. He was caught later. What the fuck? 
Tu veux Je veux Two men survived not dying in prison and just died at old age. This man forced someone to lie in front of the truck. So you tell me you're going to kill him? So you tell me he, you want him to lie in front of the truck and you're going to run him over? That would you, that, that would you say, you say that you want him to lie in front of the truck and you're probably going to run him over and kill him, right? Stupid. Since took yeah, trial like both for the robbery here? charge he oh, originally was on trial for yeah, and the murder right, of Charles right. Diles. He was convicted for both crimes and sentenced to death on the 10th of April 1998. Alva Campbell fought against his sentence, but ultimately it didn't amount to much, and his execution was set for the 15th of November 2017. On the day of his execution, the preparation went well, and as he entered the execution room, it was expected that it would be carried out without a hitch. However, this wasn't the case, as it soon became apparent that Alva could not be executed successfully. Alva's health problems prevented the team from being able to find a vein through which they could intravenously deliver the lethal drugs. After a while of trying, the team called off the execution. After the failed attempt, people wondered what would happen next. The family of Charles Diles was especially interested in the case as they wanted closure. The state rescheduled his execution for the 5th of June, 2019. On the 3rd of March, 2018, Franklin County Prosecutor Ron O'Brien announced that Alva Campbell had died of natural causes while awaiting his execution. He apparently had been suffering from lung cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, prostate cancer, and other illnesses, and he required oxygen treatments four times a day. Mr. O'Brien said that it was a shame that he managed to avoid execution. He was 69 years old at the time of his death. Willie Francis one case on this list that seems to have a lot of controversy as to whether or not they should have been convicted in the first place is the case of Willie Francis. Willie was convicted as a juvenile, which, given that this was in 20th century America, raised some eyebrows. It has been theorized by many that his conviction was racially motivated. Willie was an African American. How did it all happen? Well, it started with the death of a man known as Andrew Thomas. Mr. Thomas was a pharmacy owner in St. Martinville and a former employer of Willie Francis. For the first few months after his death, the police Police had no leads on the case. In August of 1945, though, nine months after the death of Andrew Thomas, the police arrested Willie for a completely unrelated crime. While investigating him, the police claimed that he had Andrew Thomas's wallet in his possession, and so they started to interrogate him about the murder of Mr. Th electric chair. He was 15 years old when the crime had been committed and 16 years old when he was sentenced. On the 3rd of May, 1946, Willie Francis was set to be electrocuted, but when the charge was delivered, he survived it, though he was in great pain. It turns out that the prison guard who had set up the electric chair had drunkenly set it up incorrectly. After the botched execution, an attorney named Bertrand de Blanc decided to take Willie's case and appeal to the Supreme Court. He felt it was unjust to subject him to execution again, given the ordeal that he had gone through the first time. He claimed that to do this would be a violation of the U.S. Constitution's provision for equal protection and provisions against double jeopardy and cruel and unusual punishment. His plan was to get Willie exonerated, or at the very least to have his sentence commuted. However, the case failed at the Supreme Court of the United States, and he was set to be executed again on the 9th of May, 1947. This time, his execution went as planned, and at 12.10 p.m. that day, Willie Francis was declared dead. He was 18 years old. Doyle Lee Ham. Last on this list of people who survived death row is the well-known Doyle Lee Ham. Doyle was arrested after he went on a crime spree, robbing a motel and killing a motel staff member, a man by the name of Patrick Cunningham, on the 24th of January, 1987. He was arrested with two other people, Regina and Douglas Roden. At first, they claimed to be witnesses to the crime who were testifying against Doyle, but during the police's investigation, they admitted to being accomplices of Doyle. They agreed to testify against him in order to receive reduced sentences. They claimed that they were not actively involved in the robbery or the murder of Mr. Cunningham, and Doyle was the only active party to both crimes. Doyle Ham was tried and convicted on the robbery and murder charges, and then a second jury voted 11 to 1 that he would receive the death penalty on the 28th of September, 1987. Even before his execution, Doyle Ham's case raised a lot of controversy over how his trial case was handled, leading to multiple appeals. During the second trial after he had been convicted, but before he had been sentenced, Doyle's defense had the opportunity to 
to present mitigating evidence to convince the jury to deliver a life sentence instead of the death penalty. His lawyer had spent only 19 minutes presenting mitigation evidence, which didn't include the medical and education records that indicated that he had an intellectual disability, as he had an IQ of 66, and evidence that he suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome, which is a condition where a baby is exposed to alcohol while in the womb that affects its physical and cognitive abilities. These issues with his trial were serious enough to warrant a group of former judges and state bar association presidents to petition the U.S. Supreme Court to grant legal relief to Doyle. Doyle Ham's case also gained a lot of attention from the public and many humanitarian and religious bodies when, while still on death row, he developed lymphatic cancer. They claimed that it was unnecessary to put Doyle Ham through the process of execution while he suffered from this disease and it would cause him needless pain. The United Nations anti-death penalty advocate Sister Helen Prejean, the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and the International Commission Against the Death Penalty were some of the bodies and people that appealed to Alabama Governor Kay Ivey for clemency. Regardless, Doyle Ham's execution was given the go-ahead, and on the 22nd of February, 2018, the Alabama Department of Corrections attempted to execute him. After about two and a half hours of trying unsuccessfully to execute him, the attempt was eventually canceled. Later that year, in March 2018, Doyle's lawyers and the state of Alabama reached an agreement that prevented Doyle from a second execution attempt, basically unofficially commuting his sentence to life imprisonment. This, this is what it's saying. You got, you got two people who survived. You got a couple attempts that didn't go right. You got things that didn't go right. Like, everything didn't go right for some people. And then you got people who changed the death sentence and went past it. Like, you got some money. Oh, and also, don't forget to subscribe to LJ World. Why? And like, subscribe, and hit that pull notification bell so you won't miss another LJ reaction.